The Secret Library Podcast is brought to you, as always, by our brilliant Patreon members. If you want to stay connected during the hiatus for as little as $1 a month, you can get solo episodes and updates from inside my writing process at patreon.com slash secret library. Okay, I know, I know. The hiatus was supposed to last until 2020. And I know I'm not supposed to be recording and releasing episodes. However, it is my birthday tomorrow. And as my gift to you, I, I just had to share this episode and the most amazing story about how this episode came to happen. So this summer, I had the opportunity to work on an incredible project in London, which those of you who subscribe to Footnotes will have learned more about. And during a wrap party for this project, someone came over, a friend, and said, hey, would you like to meet Philippa Gregory? So of course I said yes. And I was kind of in shock that this was even happening. And I, for ages, was trying to figure out how to record this intro without sounding like a complete um, crazy person. Like, oh yeah, I'm just running around London and hanging out with Philippa Gregory. But anyway, my friend was kind enough to introduce me to her, and we had the most wonderful conversation. And as an incredible coincidence, she was having a press event the next day at her house recording a bunch of interviews for her new book, which is out now. So... She asked if I wanted to come over and record an interview with her to talk about Tidelands and about writing in general. So of course I said yes, and now I have this episode to share with you as a treat and my birthday gift to you during this pause from recording regular episodes. So a note about the sound. I was, as we're on hiatus, not expecting to be recording podcast episodes while I was working in London. But another friend was kind enough to lend me her microphone. And since I was recording in person, we were not each sitting separately with our own audio channels. So I hope you will forgive the fact that this is recorded with a microphone sitting on the coffee table between us as we had a conversation that I think is worth any amount of difficulty with the sound. So if you're listening in a car or somewhere where you're further away from the audio rather than with headphones, there may be points where it gets a little bit quiet. So I just want you to know that in advance. Okay, let's do it. This is episode 158 of the Secret Library podcast, the surprise bonus August birthday episode. My guest is, of course, Philippa Gregory, the writer and historian. She is the author of many New York Times bestselling novels, including The Other Boleyn Girl, and is a recognized authority on women's history. Many of her works have been adapted for the screen, including The Other Boleyn Girl. Her novel, The Last Tudor, is now in production for a television series. Her most recent novel, Tidelands, is out now. Philippa graduated from the University of Sussex and received a PhD from the University of Edinburgh, where she is a regent. She holds honorary degrees from Teesside University and the University of Sussex. She's a fellow of the Universities of Sussex and Cardiff and was awarded the 2016 Harrogate Festival Award for Contribution to Historical Fiction. She is an honorary research fellow at Birkbeck, University of London. In addition, Philippa founded Gardens for the Gambia, a charity to dig wells in poor rural schools in the Gambia, and has provided nearly 200 wells. Finally, Philippa is a patron of the UK Chagos Support Association, which supports the Chagos Islanders in their struggle against British injustice. The people of Chagos were displaced by the British government when they cleared the archipelago in the Indian Ocean of its inhabitants in the 1960s and 70s to make way for an American airbase. Gregory often speaks about the Chagosians' plight and lobbies the government to take action. So I have loved and read Philippa's work for decades. Um, I am an enormous fan of the Tudor period of history. I'm obsessed with it and have read many, many books, um, historical and otherwise, on this period. But some of my very favorites have been Philippa Gregory's novels. So it was pretty mind-blowing to get to meet her, talk about the process of writing women's history, writing about figures who aren't as well documented as their male counterparts in the historical contexts, and to really dive into what it means to write historical fiction, and especially to write historical fiction about women. Um, This conversation was, was such a joy and an honor, and it's really, really so exciting to finally be able to share it with you. 
I really hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed recording it. Hi, Philippa. Thank you so much for being on. It's a pleasure. Thank you for coming. Well, it's, it's especially a pleasure for everyone listening that we're actually doing this in person, which is a rare treat. I don't often get to see the person as I'm talking to them. <laughs> well, we're here, here live in full color. In full color, I know. Maybe you'll, you'll feel that as you're listening. But, um, you know, as you have another book coming out, I'm really interested, something that I've always loved about your books is that there is this subtlety and also a structural difference between actually taking on the full experience of writing about historical characters and being inside of the historical characters' world, yet making them feel human, and the other side where they're fictional characters navigating a historical world. And in your latest book, you've moved back towards the fictional characters, and you're in a different time period, much earlier than the Tudors, so that, um, that changes things. So I'm interested in knowing how that is for you to make that shift. Well, the first step of it was just enormously freeing. So to actually go, I don't have to spend a year really plotting out this character's life, including day-to-day -day movements, uh, illnesses, pregnancies, so therefore you have to know conceptions. You know, it, it's so meticulous when you tackle a, a historical person who has a recorded biography. So that's a real challenge. If you then tackle a historical person who doesn't have a recorded biography, but you have to find their timeline from other sources, it's a very, very, very time-consuming. It's very demanding because I don't want to get it wrong. And at the same time, I don't want to, in a sense, have to fall back on what most historians use as a get-out clause, which is most women at the time were doing this, so we'll assume that she's doing this. So the research for all of my previous novels based on real characters takes up half the time of writing. This one, I set off and went like, I'll just make it up. And it was lovely. It was, you know, it's what novelists do, and I am a novelist as well as a historian. So I went, well, I'll just have that out on, and I will just give her a story, which is in a historical period. The historical period's got to be right. Her actions have got to be likely and credible in the context that she's in. But given that, I'm pretty free. And then, to my bewilderment and amusement at myself, I uh, had originally set her... Uh, on a part of the Sussex coastline which is opposite the Isle of Wight and I set her at a date and then I realised that I was very close in terms of date to the time that Charles I was imprisoned on the Isle of Wight. So although I had an encounter with uh, an enemy on the other side, very, very early on in the novel I went, oh well he's a royal spy and he's come to this unknown part of the world to get a boat across to the Isle of Wight to free Charles I in the many, many attempts that we know took place and there were far more than we know about. So he's completely plausible doing that. And then I went, oh, you're doing it again. You're right in the middle of recorded history. Now you're going to have to make sure that Charles leaves the Isle of Wight at exactly the right date, that the escape attempts are exactly plausible, that we know the name of the house that he's living in, we know the name of the church that he worshipped in, we know the name of the inn that was closest to him. All of that's got to be right. So I just gave myself, out of sheer folly, a whole chunk of historical research, which then had to be, again, absolutely accurate. But it's that, to me, that makes the story almost worth reading. Mm -hmm. That you go, here's a completely fictional story, but it's at a time that is absolutely meticulously researched. You can trust it. And that, that's all I really want to do. It's amazing that, I mean, I think whenever you're writing in a historical period where there is obviously no research. It's interesting to me, something you said earlier, that people tend to fall back on, this is what women were doing at that time, and so we'll just put them doing the same. How do you think it is, given that almost, I mean, I would say all of your books are centered around women centered in history, and that what you've done is sort of opened that up, something where women were traditionally, I mean, aside from the very most well-known ones, kind of hidden in the background. And how is it to bring them out and to really 
take on the task of working with material where there just wasn't much recorded about them. In a way, you, it makes you more, more energetic about looking for material, that there are lots of references to women doing things or even specific women's activities in the records of other things. So, for instance, Mary Bolin didn't have a biography when I wrote about her for the other Bolin girl. We don't know her date of birth. We know really nothing. There's nothing recorded. There's no section in a library, in a Tudor library, which says Mary, Mary Boleyn did this. What we do have is things like the wardrobe records from the, her first big party at court. We know she wore a green robe. We know what she was wearing because the wardrobe records are there. So if you go to the wardrobe records and, and look at them, you will see her name there and you'll see what she's wearing. We, you know, I first came across them because uh, I was looking in the naval records and Henry had uh, refurbished and relaunched a boat called uh, the Mary Boleyn. That's how her name came to me. That's not where you would look for women's social history in the naval records, but there are women in there. So in a sense, it's by being very, very wide, spreading your net very wide and not ignoring the tiniest, weirdest things that crop up, that you get to piece together a, a, a reliable life, even of the least known women. And it amazes me how you can go back a long, long way and still find names of individual women putting their names on individual contracts, though they have no legal status. You know, it, the history is there. What we've suffered from for so long is originally male trained historians because women weren't in universities till 1920 um, set not interested in poor women because they're not interested in poor people anyway so why would they be interested in poor women saying like there's nothing there um, I mean in a sense there is nothing there if what you're looking for is a you know promising politician you know don't don't look in the courts of law because you won't find him there you won't find him prosecuted for shoplifting but you will find Hundreds, thousands of women prosecuted for shoplifting, prosecuted for stealing food, prosecuted for aborting their babies or miscarrying their babies. You know, there, there, there are the records, but you've got to have the desire to know what you know them. So, in a sense, it always comes from what do I want to find, and you will find it. Mm -hmm. uh, archaeologists say that all the time. You only find what you're looking for. You never find the thing you're not looking for, because you're not looking for it. So it's not visible to you. You walk through it. That's amazing. I, I'm really interested in the trend you're seeing because we are, I think, becoming increasingly interested in history. I mean, we've always been interested in history. But the, the genre of historical fiction has grown tremendously. And how do you see that evolving as you've really covered the Tudors better than anyone else and then expanded past that what do you see people, you know, in readers and, and this kind of desire to feel what these people felt at that time, especially the women that have been so underrepresented? I think one of the signs of any group coming to a sort of sense of themselves and their own importance, which is essential to one's health, is that you start going like, well, what what was what was it like before us? So Women's history absolutely comes out of the women's movement. Uh, so you look at people like Sheila Rowbottom, who write the great book, um, Hidden from History, which basically says, here are all these people who have not been included in history, have actually been concealed by the written history because the written history didn't think they were of any interest. And that, she comes out of the women's movement to write that. Um, and that's because, firstly, you go like, in what way are we conscious of ourselves as ourselves? In what way does this differ from what we've been told we're like? Are we submissive? Are we family loving? Are we naturally loyal and naturally tender? Do we cry more? Can we park cars? I mean, all of the ridiculous things that people say about women, when you start to come to a true sense of yourself, you examine them. And that leads you almost inevitably to, well, if we are, if our brains are as good at functioning as male brains, if there's no discernible difference between the female and the male brain, greater than the difference between men and men brains or women and women brains. There's a spectrum of difference and a man or a woman 
an individual man or woman could come on any level of that. If we're as clever as men, how come we've only got into universities in the last century when they were formed ten centuries before? How does that happen? And you have to go, well, there are reasons for that. And that leads you to like what's the history of women in education? Why don't we get why don't we get the education our brothers get? Which takes you immediately to Virginia Woolf, of course, and all the other people, Mary Wollstonecraft, and back and back and back in time to all the women who have said, like, there ought to be girls' schools. So all the time there weren't girls' schools, there were women who had got educated one way or another, saying, Why aren't there girls' schools? And that gets you into women's history, just automatically. So I think Women's history is a natural development of women's self-consciousness and women's sense of that relevance and importance in the world today. And that's why it's, in one way to me, it's a revolutionary act. To do women's history is a radical act. And that's another reason why I love it so much, because it changes the world. It changes how we see the past, and that changes how we see the present. And then where historical fiction goes, I think it, I mean, I think what's been interesting over the last 30 years since I've been working in historical fiction is that it's become much more modern. So when I started, I had read the great historical fiction writers of the 1950s, and they were very deferential, and they were very locked in a view of women, which was typical of the 1950s. So the happy ending was that you married a prince. Uh, so they were quite stereotypical, as we would think now. Of course, we are now working on different stereotypes. So, you know, if you want to write a woman today, you wouldn't get, you wouldn't do a very successful novel if she was actually rather ineffectual and wanted to be an ivy clinging to a strong oak tree. You couldn't tell that story to a modern readership with much hopes of success. You'd have to find some way of selling it to them because it's not how we think we are. So I think fiction, like, you know, history follows the inquiry of what are we and why did we get here? And fiction follows very much a how can we tell a story that fits how we think we are currently? So if women continue to progress in terms of their acceptance in the world and their position in the world and their claim to highest office, if women continue to do that, then I think we'll have more fictions about women succeeding because that's how we think women are. If there's a massive pushback, as I would predict, then we're going to have an awful lot more uh, stories about women who find success. But, you know, there's a tragic hollowness about her life because she doesn't, isn't loved by a man and she hasn't got children. And you know, you know when that pushback is coming because people start going on and on about the joys of maternal love and, and, and love from a man. And I experience maternal love. I'm a big fan of maternal love. But I think offering it to women as an alternative to worldly success is an absolute temptation for women to retreat from the struggle which we must engage in. Absolutely. I think that's so important, and I think that yeah, being able to tell stories, I mean, there's this cyclical nature, and then you get into this sort of, I mean, for lack of a better term, chicken and egg argument. You know, are young women reading stories about women succeeding and doing well out in the world and having options other than just marrying and having babies? Therefore, they start to think, oh, I could do that too. Therefore, then they're writing more stories because it feels more genuine, and it sort of feeds on itself. But you're right, if there's pushback and people think, and you hear this all the time, um, you know, people push back on, well, don't you want a baby? And, you know, <clears throat> aren't you missing out on something? Or, you know, all kinds of things that people feel very free to say. Mm -hmm. No, no, to anyone. No, you're a young woman, you must get that all the time. Yeah. You know, it's extraordinary how, yeah. how what a powerful narrative it is to young women. Uh, and it does mean, it absolutely does mean, are you sure you should be in the job you're in? Yeah, it's concealed, but that's exactly what it means. Yeah, are, are you? I mean, there is an element of like, how dare you take most of your time to focus on something that you think is more important? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that these stories, especially when you look at the period of the Tudors, and especially with Henry, who's just, you know, if you're not producing 
what I want you to produce when you're out of here. And that that was the only value that they had. It's extraordinary that we're, we've gotten hundreds of years past it, and no, nobody's getting their head cut off for it, but there's still, it's metaphorical now, it's not physical. I think it's because there is this absolutely core belief in what is the nature of women, and I don't think we've moved, we haven't moved a general understanding of that on. I think women discuss it, feminists discuss it, historians discuss it, uh, specialists discuss it, but I think there is still, throughout society, uh, a general acceptance of things that were first said by Plato and Aristotle, and subsequently by the church fathers, the early church fathers. You know, we are raising women in the model of medieval churchmen. And you go, how can this be? You know, like we're, you know, we're celebrating this year landing a man on the moon, a man on the moon, with many mission control. But, you know, like we've moved, we've actually moved off our planet, and we still think that astronauts' wives should be asked what, they, what their husband had for breakfast. You know, it, it's extraordinary. It is. Especially given that all of the computers on those missions were mostly women doing those calculations so quickly. Which we didn't find out, we didn't know till so recently. Yeah, but no one was talking about it. And then you go all the way back to your current book to women being prosecuted, or not prosecuted, because that sounds like a court, but, but threatened, their lives threatened by having knowledge that could not be codified in sort of a male academic system. I think it's even worse than that. My heroine is a midwife. Right. And uh, she's working at a time where there is no real science. So the death rate is horrific. Infection, nobody knows about bacterial infection. So infection rates are horrific. For example, Queen Jane, Henry the First, Henry the Eighth's wife, dies probably of postpartum fever, which if you had these days, a doctor will give you antibiotics in a moment, and you'll be better in a day. I mean, it's extraordinary how dangerous those times were for the wealthiest of women. So my heroine is working as a midwife, and it's just, she's in the 17th century. So it's just at a time where men are codifying the medical profession and turning it into a profession, licensing midwives, and rather beginning to feel that midwifery is something that men should be doing, that it should be professionalized and controlled. And therefore, there is a real push against these women who are using time-honored practices, herbs that they know really well, doing the best they can. Absolutely a high death rate, but that's the nature of the society altogether. Uh, and, the, and the men professionalizing midwifery are pushing back against traditional knowledge. And that, at the same time, comes at a rising anxiety that lots of people give you different explanations for. But there's a rising anxiety across Europe about women and what they know and what they do when they gather together, about whether the society is completely reliable, whether it's safe. There's a lot of political change and disruption. And that's what gives rise to the witch hunts. And in the States, you see it. You know, later, obviously, Salem is so famous. But there is a sort of almost worldwide hysteria about witchcraft, which by now has been established in people's mind as a female crime, a female sin. And uh, my heroine is caught up in this as a herbalist, as a midwife, as a woman without physical means of support. She, she is immensely successful in her personal life, in surviving. She doesn't have a husband because he's deserted her, which is very, very typical of uh, a lot of 17th century marriages as well, uh, that they end in desertion because they can't end in divorce because it's not available. So people just run away, which means that these women are left without support and their wealthier neighbors are terrified that they're going to fall into poverty and call on their wealthier neighbors. And it's the time of the Civil War, so there's a lot of anxiety about what's going to happen. You know, in the course of the novel, they actually execute Charles I. So there's this sense of what in the world is going to happen to us. And in the middle of this, there's something that's stolen, and there's an absolute belief that uh, this suspect woman who is suspect 
for me for reasons which are far away from the circumstances of the actual crime that, that she's almost certainly to blame. And so her entire community turned on her, which was the experience of literally hundreds of women in that period. I find it I mean, looking obviously from this time period back gives you a lot of benefit of kind of looking at different societies and how they've evolved. But we look at groups of people who've been in power, primarily white men, obviously, and how threatened they are by anyone else having this knowledge and this kind of paranoia that comes up. I mean, you see it in you know, we, we were discussing The Handmaid's Tale before, but you see it in all of these societies of people who think, oh, they're going to come and take away what we have and we have to protect what we have. It happens with extremely wealthy people. It happens with people in control in small societies. And there's this impulse to demonize the people that are being kept down by their control. And in this sense, it's, it's a control of information. And I'm fascinated by how you put it, because I think it's absolutely right, that... The idea of professionalizing anything is usually to put it into the hands of men and make their system around it and to discard anything that they can't explain themselves. Mm -hmm. There is that, and I think that obviously human nature, from for, for evolution reasons, has a real temptation to go us and other because that's you know we we come from family structures and tribal structures, so that's really natural to us. But I think that what we see with the um, the evolution, what actually ends up being the evolution of capitalism, is the way that you the way that you succeed in a society in which goods and benefits are rationed is that you make a tribe around your around the thing that you've got. So if you've got a castle you get your soldiers together, you guard your castle, and that's your castle. You never give your castle up. You 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 sally out of it to try and get another castle, and that's how that's how you would measure success. Equally, if you have knowledge, you make a tribe around your knowledge, and you say only we're going to have this. The first people who invented forceps never shared it with anybody else, though it was a life-saving device. It was a secret. You could only you could your as a woman you could only access the help of high level forceps to deliver a baby that was stuck in the womb if you could afford to pay this one doctor to come to your house and deliver you. And he was based in London and he would only come out if you were very rich. And when he moved, when he retired, he gave the secret to his two sons. So it was entirely a life-saving thing. I mean, unbelievably important. The only option for women whose babies were stuck high in the womb was to die in labour and that then there would be a caesarean, but you could only do caesarean on dead women. So it's, I mean, it's it's such a huge, such a huge attack on women, and nobody said anything about it. It was absolutely, they'd invented it with their invention, they had the right to exploit it. And we see the same thing now with medicine as well. You know, they have, you know, there's patents on medicine, laws protect it, but, you know, this could save everyone, but if you can't afford it, then forget it. All of the work on uh, extra aging, super aging, getting over 100, all of the nutritional work and all of the blood work that would be required is so expensive. It's only for, for, for wealthy people. So basically, you're in a situation where the rich, not only having sucked up an unfair amount of the world's goods all of their lives, are going to have an extra 30 years and consume even more. I mean, it's, 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 it's extraordinarily illogical. It makes no sense if you stand back and look at it. But because we're in the middle of it, it we don't ask those questions. No. And I think that that's the role of literature in some ways, is to show the consequences either in a historical time and to make us consider how would this play out now? How does it change it to look at it now? Or to think, okay, you know, you have something like an alternative history where Here's another way it could have gone, even by one small change, or just looking back at the impact and what people had to do and thinking, how has this changed now, and how are some things exactly the same as they were? I think I'm always working in alternative histories because by taking the view of women, or in the case by taking the view of a poor woman as well, a poor woman midwife, 
in a really unfashionable part of the country. I mean, it's, it's not very well known as the south coast of England, the Sussex coast. It's not very well known even now. It's not a big resort area. Um, by taking the view of the marginalised, you, you are, in a sense, writing an alternative history because you're going, if we saw that, if we took their lives seriously, if we listened to their voices, if we saw what they need, we wouldn't have produced a society like we did. So it can be entirely historically accurate and also challenge how things happened. I think that's so important and I think it's something that, that people should consider as they're writing, you know, and it's, I mean, how do you bring that in? Because this is something where, that I struggle with in writing, is that you, know, you have all of these ideas that you feel so strongly about, but you don't want to write a book that sounds like a ranting maniac saying, you know, like you're standing on the cover of, you know, a magazine shouting, we need to change this. Yeah. But you want to convey a message and yet create a book that people want to read. I think, especially in terms of freedom for women and social justice, really the facts speak for themselves. What you're doing is you're writing a counter fiction. So there is already out there a very well established fiction which says kings rule everything. Uh, at the time, kings said they were closer to God than the common people, which is why they rule everything. It's okay that kings should have everything, even now. It's okay that the rich should have everything because they have, I'm doing air quotes, <laughs> air quotes, earned it. How do you earn eight billion? You simply can't. Because what's your hourly rate? Why is your hourly rate so much? Are your thoughts so much, so much, so much better than the guy who washes your car? No, they can't be. You've been lucky. You've inherited money. You've, 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 you've played a system. You've gamed in some way. Like, I'm absolutely happy that people are rich and I'm really sorry that people are poor. But the differential is covered in our society by a fiction of merit and worth. And it's that that fiction can really skewer, because if you look at the lives of poor people, you see that they are very, very meritorious and very, very worthy, and they work very hard. It's not the people who are homeless are lazy or stupid or somehow deserve to be on the streets. They've just got unlucky in a system which is absolutely skewed to luck and inheritance and fraud. I, I couldn't agree more. I, this is an argument that, I, that it really it, it really does my head in because I, you do hear this all the time. Like, I've worked so hard for this. And I, don't, <laughs> I don't discredit that, but it, it always feels to me, my analogy in my head, or the metaphor rather, is if you think of a very tall building and somebody says, I've worked very hard for this. So maybe they've started at the 12th floor yes, because they're quite wealthy and they've made 10 floors of effort. So they get up to the 22nd floor. But there's also people who start in the basement and they maybe make 30, you know, mm. or, or just as much effort, if not more, but they still come up below. And you can't say that they haven't worked as hard. It's just that they've started yeah. at a different place. And, and so you can't use that argument. Yeah. You can't use the argument that, that it's pure effort because that's a lie. And 90% of women won't ever get in the building. Right. <laughs> like, they're not even coming in the basement, you know. There are plenty There's a bunch of guards standing around. There are plenty of guys in here. We don't need a woman at this point. Right. You know, I agree with you, but in the, in the question, how does one express one's true feelings about, say, social justice? I, I think, to me, better not express them at all, because there isn't a way to do them. I mean, if somebody asks you, like you've kindly done today, then yes, I say. But I wouldn't do it in a novel because it, it's not, it doesn't have a place in a novel. In a novel, the, 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 the story of the novel should speak for itself. So if someone should read it and not go, oh, Philip Gregory thinks this. They should read it and go, I think this. I've just read this. I've internalized this reading experience. I have been with these characters. I understand now a whole load about the society and women's place in it that I didn't understand before. I reflected on that, on how that compares to my lived experience. So I've had a reading experience, now I've had a lived experience. They add up. Whoa, that's, that's how I want to talk to people, which is like just to tell them how I see it, how I imagine it, how I think it truly was. And then if they come from that to 
what a conclusion they do. Brilliant. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's how you don't do politics in your novel, because in any case, in some ways, it's not the time to do it. So even my heroine, in the midst of really terrible cruelty and oppression, she never goes, it's not right to treat women like this, because she's in her time, she thinks it's how all women are always treated. And partly her passivity under it is a sort of call to arms to the modern woman who has gone out of that, thank God. Yes, and says how, how wonderful that we, you know, in most cases we wouldn't experience that now. We experience um, it in different ways. The thing is, it's like, it's a big world. There are places in the world where women suffer terrible abuse uh, on a medieval scale with a medieval theology to explain it. And, you know, it really behoves us as Western modern women to bear that in mind and to do what we can. Uh, but yes, in the modern world that we live, uh, we have legal rights. We have the vote. We have the right in England to equal pay. We don't have equal pay, but it's enshrined in law that we should be able to have it. Um, when it comes, nobody knows. I don't believe that we'll ever come unless we make a radical change to the system. I agree. Well, I think it's a brilliant start to tell stories that have been left out and to include information that people have been missing in order to get them thinking and asking the right questions about themselves and about the world. And, and hopefully we can push that forward. And I, that's true. But the other thing about um, writing a novel is like, from my point of view, somebody takes it on holiday, sits in the sun, reads it on a sun lounger, loves it, it's completely absorbed by it, shuts it, leaves it in the hotel room, that's okay as well. Because at a certain level, which we haven't discussed really, I'm a, I'm a novelist, I love the form of the novel. I don't come off reading a Jane Austen novel feeling particularly radicalised or, or particularly thinking about women's rights, though they are tucked away in there as well. I come I come out of a Jane Austen novel just being so glad that such an art form existed and that, and that one can access it so easily. I mean, I, I adore fiction writing. So there's a part of it which is that it's a form of art. It doesn't have to say anything. It doesn't have to do anything. It happens that I come to this art form with these feelings as well. So my art tends to have that in it. But it's not a prerequisite for a good novel. I think so. I think that there are different reasons that you pick up books, and there are different reasons that you engage with them, and different reasons and different points in your life when you need different kinds of reading. And, and you'll read the same book at different times, and it's a completely different experience. That's, so, that's, I think, one of the greatest things about it, is that it is a participatory thing. Reading is as much, in a way, an art, in, and you bring as much to it as a reader as you, as you want to. I have readers write to me. Uh, one quite recently with an interpretation of my book and said, is this what you meant? And I went, no. I ne that never occurred to me, but I can see how you can make it work. In a way, you have to say the reader takes, I mean, writing the novel is half the process. The second half of the process is the reader reading their book, which won't be everybody's book. And that's why book clubs are so great. People come and say, like, she meant that, and the book for life. She can't have done Nothing like it. But uh, literally, I this it was a uh, man reader. This guy wrote to me and said, "Do you mean that when she falls asleep, page ten or something, that the rest, the whole of the rest of the novel is a dream sequence?" Wow. And I said, "No, <laughs> no, not at all. I never imagined that at all. I never imagined that. And actually, it works perfectly well. You, I could have written it like that if I had wanted to write a dream sequence." which, by the way, I wouldn't want to do, but... Yeah, yeah, that sounds really tricky. Oh, it's... You know, do you know Pitch Martin? No. Oh, read that. I mean, it's... That's... I can't... Spoilers, spoilers, spoilers. Read Pitch Martin and think about uh, the, the, what you can do, in a sense, never going outside your protagonist's head. Oh. That's a nice challenge. Uh, it's a, not a very long book. It's Wim Golden. I think it's... A, I wrote a forward to it, if you pick up a, I can't remember the publisher, 
but uh, there's a there's an edition out now with a forward, oh, uh, which which we actually put at the end because I couldn't write it without doing spoilers. So I said it's oh, got really to be an course. end note. I, I, when they said to me, "Would you write it?" I said, "Yes, but it's got to be an end note because yeah. you've got to the reader's got to have the experience of this immersive story and then step back and think about it." And I have to say, when I first read it in my twenties, I didn't get it at all. And 40 years later, I wrote an end note, which is like, this is what I think after 40 years. This is what I think. That's amazing how books, there are books that you read in your 20s, I think, is even younger, but just never leave. Yes. Well, they never leave you. Also, mm -hmm. I mean, I can remember phrases from books that I read when I was a little girl. And there's a book by Elizabeth Good called The Little White Horse. Just apps, I mean, I read it in, in school. And I remember it now. I mean, it was a tremendously powerful story. Again, and I can see traces of it in my first novel. But like, I am someone who read that, and then twenty years later wrote a novel. It's about it. it one of its many themes is about the power of the land over someone who feels very close to it, and I'm someone who loves living in nature, loves the environment, loves being in the natural world. And White Acre, my first novel, was about a girl who would not leave the, the place she'd been born, the country estate in Sussex. Yes, I remember that one. A long time ago now. Yeah. It celebrated its 30th anniversary uh, about two years ago. Amazing. And it got it, it charted in the top ten again 30 years on. Oh, congratulations. I know. It's really fantastic. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to, to speak, and it's, it's really been an honour. This has been a real pleasure. Thank you for coming, and I've enjoyed having you in my lovely home. Yes, it is <laughs> lovely. So lovely. Yeah, no, it's been good fun. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the Secret Library podcast. We hope you've enjoyed this week's show. You can keep the conversation going by leaving a comment in the show notes at secretlibrarypodcast.com or visit us on Facebook at facebook.com slash secretlibrarypodcast. You can also connect directly with me on Twitter or Instagram where I'm Caro Donahue. That's at C-A-R-O-D-O-N-A-H-U-E. I look forward to chatting with you there. 